Hello, friends. Welcome to Nexus, a smart buildings technology podcast for smart humans. I'm your host, James Dice. If we haven't met before, I write a weekly newsletter on this same topic. It's also called Nexus. Each week, I share what I've learned, my opinions, and what I'm excited about in the quickly evolving world of intelligent buildings. Readers have called Nexus the best way to stay up to date on the future of this industry without all the marketing fluff. You can check it out and subscribe at nexus.substack.com or click the link in the show notes. Since starting the Nexus newsletter, many of you have reached out to me wanting to talk shop, and we have. After a few weeks of those wonderful conversations, I realized I needed to record and share them with our growing community. So here we are. The Nexus podcast is born. This is our chance to explore and learn with the brightest in our industry together. Episode 24 is a conversation with Mike Bruman, CEO of Vanti, a master systems integrator out of the UK. We talked about why buildings are behind and how the problem of closed or proprietary systems extend beyond just HVAC. Then we took a bit of a deep dive into the role of the master systems integrator, which is often misunderstood in our industry. Finally, Mike explained the open source effort Vanti is launching called SmartCore. I'm very excited about SmartCore and can't wait to hear your feedback and see people get involved in this effort. This episode of the podcast is directly funded by listeners like you who have joined the Nexus Pro membership community. You can find info on how to join and support the podcast at nexus.substack.com. You'll also find the show notes there and a link to Mike's LinkedIn page. Oh, and by the way, if you take a look at your podcast feed and you're missing some episodes, that's because those episodes are exclusive to members of Nexus Pro. Sign up for a pro membership to get your personal podcast feed with access to all of the episodes. Without further ado, please enjoy Nexus Podcast episode 24. All right. Hello, Mike. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Uh, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Thanks so much for having me. So I'm Mike Bruman. I'm CEO at Vanti. We're a master systems integrator, 40 people based in Birmingham in the UK. Great. Great. Thanks. So yeah, so let's get started with just your career history in general. So maybe go from present day backwards. So when did you start Vanti and then what did you do before that? Okay, cool. So um, I actually didn't start Vanti. My business partner, Raj, uh, all his <laughs> idea. So whilst he was at uni, was uh, going around the country on his bike or around London on his bike, kind of installing audio visual equipment into venues and that kind of thing. We actually met because he was at university in Birmingham. Uh, and that was my first job out of uni, actually. So I was a uh, network manager in a secondary school, which was a total baptism of fire. Um, mm. Just overnight became sysadmin for 900 users and had never done any of it before. So it was pretty steep learning curve. Uh, good fun. So, uh, yeah, we just really hit it off because we were both very passionate about people being able to use technology and it being really accessible to them. So we got into the world of AV through a kind of little remote controls that you could put on the walls of classrooms so that when teachers moved between rooms, they had a, a consistent interface to turn everything on and off and all that kind mm. of thing. They didn't need to find the remote control or have students steal the batteries and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, Raj had to uh, stay and complete his degree. I went off to the world of IT management consultancy. So worked for a company called Capgemini and worked for the foreign office in the UK for nine months. And then I really wanted to be in, in infrastructure. It's what I've always been interested in. And unfortunately, I couldn't see a route through with, with Cap to make that happen. So uh, left there, joined Accenture and then worked with a whole bunch of clients all over the world. So did some quite big pieces of work with Dell Computers, so over in Texas and in Asia Pacific, and then did all kinds of stuff with people like BlackBerry, uh, Research in Motion. Uh, that was my best project ever, actually. Tested mobiles for a week in Israel, because it's one of the only places in the world where the CDMA network coexists with GSM. Um, so easily the best thing ever, although I did get stopped by the security services on the way out, which uh, was less fun. Um, and then after that, Raj was kind of badgering me to uh, come back and join him. So I was employee number five back in November 2008. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So I've been through a few iterations, started out as uh, RTS and then rebranded as Vanity 2011. Got it. Okay, cool. And, and what is Vanity today? What do you guys do? 
Uh, so Vanti today is a whole mix of stuff. So hidden away in the name is audio, visual and IT. Although uh, thankfully our marketing company at the time kind of went, we don't think you guys are going to stay and just do this stuff forever. Mm-hmm. So you have the option if you want to later on that you can drop the story in and just go with Vanti as a, as a brand. That makes sense. So we still have some, some kind of pure play AV and IT clients. We have uh, a managed services practice that runs kind of standard service desk, looks after networks. Um, we do that for a couple of multinational clients, uh, which is good. And we've extended that over time to then introduce more and more operational technology into that. So we really started bringing AV and IT together when we did the, the central library in Birmingham, which is uh, the library of Birmingham, as you might expect. Uh, and um, we made a bit of a name for ourselves in that industry because we really started getting into it just as it was becoming kind of really heavily network based. And because we had that good understanding of IT, it allowed us to start delivering a lot of ABA rights IP solutions uh, and also doing a lot more kind of in software. And then we started moving into control systems. And then eventually we did our first smart building in 2015. Hmm. So today we are still a real mix. I think our focus though is now primarily on the built environment. We see a huge opportunity in the space and also uh, a huge skills gap. And yeah, it's where we're, we're choosing to play. So um, looking at our plans at the moment for the next three to five years, we've just developed our first product called Kahoo, which is a kind of smart workplace solution, uh, which is quite fun. So just looking at getting patents sorted and that kind of thing on that. And then um, the, the idea is that we'll continue along with the MSI journey, hopefully doing more and more around systems integration and buildings. All right, cool. Well, we're going to nerd out on some of that stuff. Uh, I want to talk to you about the MSI in a second. But first, I want to ask you my favorite question, which is why are buildings like decades behind other technology? And this would be a really unique answer for me. So I'm excited. No pressure, but I I just think it will be. I'll try my best. (laughs) Um, So I've obviously listened and watched a lot of the, the podcast previously. And I think the thing that's really interesting for me is the number of different lenses there are on a building as a kind of ecosystem of stuff. So I think broadly it's behind because of the complacency in the industry. I think Mm. there's not really been that um, impetus or motivation to kind of get on board. I think automotive had it a lot from a kind of safety and, you know, infotainment perspective, like getting mapping in and, you know, entertainment in cars and all that kind of stuff. And then now as we move into kind of Tesla and we're looking at software updated products and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think if you look at buildings generally as a kind of end to end thing and over their entire life cycle, because the people who are paying, and in fact, Andrew Rogers like summed this up beautifully for me in terms of that, that disconnect between the pain and the people that are paying. Yeah. Um, And so I think, It's been really interesting, certainly over the last few years, as things have gone from kind of what is a smart building to how do I get one? Um, It feels like that kind of gap is almost being closed in that people are now starting to demand it on the kind of tenant side of things. Mm. And investors are kind of starting to listen at at the other end of stuff. But I think also just the, the cycles that are involved in buildings, right? I mean, you're pulling a building out of the ground, you're talking about a design period of two to three years, and it's only really the very largest kind of portfolio developers that could think about iterating quickly. Like if you're a, a developer that's a, a kind of small or mid-sized one, you might be looking at doing a building every two to three years. And so unless you're someone that's really out there and, and looking for new ways of doing stuff, chances are you're, you're in a world of do what we've always done, get what we've always got. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the whole pandemic situation, particularly for commercial buildings, is really interesting because you now have a, a whole set of property owners and landlords that are really sitting there going, oh, we used to just kind of collect rent checks every quarter and now actually we need to start giving people a reason to come back into our buildings and um you know people like anthony slumbers and draw poleg they 
can talk to this far better than I can, but I think there's some real tectonic shifts happening at that level. And I think it is really dawning on some people that actually they are going to have to move into that kind of service space, that it isn't anymore just about, okay, we've built a building on a plot of land, look at the amazing view out of the window, here's how much it costs you every quarter. Like that just isn't going to fly anymore. And I think the other exciting thing and, and something, you know, as I mentioned, even from the super early days of working together with Raj is those spaces are going to become a lot more about the experience within them. It's not going to be about desk farms anymore. It's going to be about how do we come together and actually collaborate around stuff. And I also think I loved uh, Deb Nolo from Switch, just analogy of kind of 1990s ERP. I, I mean, as someone who used to be an Oracle consultant and sat in that world and just sat looking at blue screens with yellow fields going, why is this system this bad? Like, <laughs> how do people work with this every day? I, I just think there's so much potential to, to make it better. And I think the ultimate reasons it's decades behind is property and construction are just really late to the party. And I think they're also hugely risk averse industries. And um, actually, one thing that does spring to mind, I'll never forget the event I went to over in Berlin. It was previously a sustainability conference that rebranded around PropTech because PropTech was getting kind of cool. And I met this lady, I won't name the portfolio owner, but 40 billion euros of property under management. And we kind of, we got chatting like, you know, what do you do, all that kind of stuff. And she was a bit interested in kind of smart buildings as a thing, like what is one, not how to. And um she was like, oh, no, I can't really see this ever taking off. And I was like, well, what do you think would be required to make it happen? And her, her genuine answer was regulation. And at that point, I was ready to just get on a plane and, and come home. I was like, if we have to wait for legislation to achieve this, then we're doomed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that really stuck with me from that conversation was her use of the words first followers. And the thing that she was really open about it, and she was just saying, as soon as we see someone else do something and it has business advantage and there's returns on it, she was like, we get all over it. Like we'll be on it all over it like a rash until that point, we won't take the risk because actually we don't know if it will work. And I think we've seen that play out. I mean, we've taken people to like our flagship smart building. They've had a great time. They've got it all. They've spoken to clients, you know, got great vibes, all that kind of stuff. And then we've had a follow-up call kind of days later and they're like, cool. So can you take us to 10 more? And you're just like, it's just not there yet. And, and it's almost like you can't kind of show people enough in terms of the traditional like technology adoption curve. I think we're still in, early adopter and innovator territory. We're not, yeah. we're certainly not even early majority yet. It's got a way to go. Got it. Yeah. It's funny. The adoption curve requires people to go first. And if people aren't coming first, then that's a big problem. All right, cool. I want to build on uh, several things you said there. So first of it is you mentioned Andrew. So Andrew Rogers, for those who didn't listen to that episode, it'll be about five episodes back. I'm not sure when this one will air, but around number 20 or 19 or something like that. So Andrew and I talked about openness and we were mostly talking about the building automation system world. So in that episode, we walked from, you know, basically sensor to platform and talked about all the different ways that something could be open or not open in most cases. So something that you and I have talked about before is that you come from the audiovisual world, and there are obviously all these other silos beyond BAS and audiovisual. And what you told me was like, there's a big four equivalents in these other areas, right? And, and oh, they yeah, have the same sort of patterns, right? Of proprietary and sort of way too much hardware, redundant hardware, redundant networks. So can you explain that for people that come from the BAS world about how you understand their pain and uh, you've seen these same patterns from other sides? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, well, maybe touch on AV first. So the, the two big players up until reasonably recently were AMX and Crestron. So they were the kind of go-to, whether it was, you know, high-end resi or, or commercial. Early on, we were really fortunate. AMX backed us a huge amount from when we were really small. And I think they could see that we were really going to kind of push their stuff. We're mm -hmm. one of very few integrators that work with Java libraries directly on their controllers. Most integrators work in a programming language called Netlinks, 
which is completely proprietary to AMX. So it's very similar in terms of, if you look back over the heritage of all these different systems, they've all come from a very similar place. And it's normally someone at some stage when, oh, I really wish something could be automated, or I really wish like I could get some information out of something to, to show it to people or to react to it or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, it is actually part of AMX's uh, training videos. You have to learn that AMX was founded because the guy who actually built some of the first control systems was kind of using his garage door opener and he wanted to automate some stuff around it. And, you know, this then huge multi-million dollar business kind of grew from there. Like it's absolutely insane. But I think if you look at the patterns across pretty much every industry, they've all been through it. Like even things like CCTV, where we used to put lashings of coax cable through buildings to plug a camera into an MVR in a room, has now all come onto uh, IP networks because it's just a no-brainer. Like there's so many well-developed standards that exist in IT. And the reality is that IT as an industry just dwarfs you know whether it's BAS whether it's AV whether it's CCTV access whatever you like it is orders of magnitude larger and also has a lot of well-established patterns of how to plug things together whether that's physically using structured cabling or if it's software patterns in terms of how things interact with each other so I, I really do feel the pain and I think it was kind of astonishing for us that when we started looking outside of of AV that actually all of these other industries were in pretty much exactly the same state. And I think also the other interesting thing is the demographic of people who are in those industries is predominantly white, predominantly male, and predominantly getting older It mm. is, the, is the thing. And actually, if you look around and we have events in the UK like the uh, Building Controls Industry Association, we turned up to one of their events, I think, for the first time two or three years ago. We were lucky to be taken along by a partner. And um, yeah, we just kind of sat in the room. We were like, we are literally the youngest people in here. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm still 38, but there were very few, like you could count them on one hand, the people who were not in the kind of senior years of 50s, 60s and about to retire. So Yeah, I think there is this, and we've talked about it previously in terms of this coming together, you know, the the first stage is everything gets onto the same physical media. And I think we're kind of at that point now, you know, most BS systems will plug into a network, CCTV, access control, you know, pretty much everything that goes into a building now uses structured cabling. The the bit that we're missing now is that convergence around the, the network infrastructure, so the active equipment, the server infrastructure and just trying to get away from system head ends, you know, PCs that are bought from Dell or PC World in the UK. And uh, then they're just kind of chucked in the back of a server rack. And I think that was the other amazing thing when we started getting more into the, the building services side of this was we would walk into like really quite prestigious buildings and you'd go into this dark back room where facilities management lived And you'd have like XP workstations just kind of sat there with, you know, the nice hill background on. And you're just kind of looking at it from an IT perspective, being like, that thing should have been in the bin like five years ago. It's completely unsecure. Like there's no patches coming out for it. This is not okay. Uh, And then I think, well, we could get into a whole world of, you know, good backup techniques and all that kind of stuff. We've been involved in projects where no one took a backup of the building management system. And so three months of changes as part of commissioning were just lost. You know, you've got people stood there going, oh, I didn't know it needed a backup. And (laughs) in IT terms, I mean, that would just be kind of failure of 101. Yeah. Um, But it's, it's a different perspective. And I think it's where we still need all of this specialist skill. We just also need it to be network aware and software enabled. I think that's the the kind of next next part of the journey. Got it. Cool. Well, I, I think people will be happy to hear that, that their experiences are mirrored elsewhere. So that's great. Uh, I also wanted to follow up on something you said about Andrew and that conversation as well. The 
sort of, I think what Andrew called it was the consumer pain distance. So we, we don't have feedback from the people that are using the technology when we make our technology choices. And that's one of the reasons why the industry is behind. So I want to talk to you about your experiences around this, around um, what I'm seeing on some of my projects that I'm working on right now, where there's this disconnect between tenants and landlords, right? And what I'm seeing is that the landlords right now are kind of feeding into this disconnect because they're like, on this one project, it's a marquee office building in New York City, huge project, and they don't really care about connecting to the tenant systems whatsoever. And I, I want to hear what you think, because you told me, you know, space utilization and better in-building experiences for occupants, like these things are all intertwined with better management information for the building owner and improve, you know, all this stuff is intertwined, especially between the tenant and the landlord. So. I want to know like how you're seeing all of these things come together when you have these separate mindsets, separate systems in these office buildings. Uh, yeah. So I think, I mean, the short answer is we're not. And I think we've been involved with, yeah, even kind of big four accountancy firms who've got this whole smart workplace initiative on the go and they're taking hundreds of thousands of square feet in, you know, prime real estate. And their smart team uh, were absolutely livid because their property team had signed into this lease mm. and no one had asked the question about could they connect to these systems. And they arranged a meeting with the landlord as a follow up, like you know, brand new tenants coming into the building and said, you know, we've got this workplace app. We use it to control our space. But actually, we really want to um, be able to interface with kind of base build systems. And I think yeah. they had HVAC and, and lighting in as part of their kind of what we would call a cat a fit out i don't know if if that's similar mm -hmm. terminology yeah. um in the us and um the landlord just turned around and went no and yeah. they were literally i mean they were taking i think it was about eight hundred thousand square feet of space so this is like it's big money but mm -hmm. because they'd signed on the dotted line and because they saw it as just you know too much of an issue and it was deemed a security risk it just wasn't happening and so I think, well, this goes back to everything that we were saying earlier around kind of the value that landlords need to provide now. And I think that for me is a real case in point where that big four accountancy firm will now never turn up to a building again without having asked that question first. Yeah. And I would imagine they will be writing those terms into their heads, you know, before they sign a lease. And that's where I think we are closing that kind of demand cycle that we mentioned but it takes a long time right it's this very protracted cycle of things it's loads of kind of fragmentation around who owns what there's lots of kind of pension funds that back this stuff there's private developers there's no real kind of well that's not fair actually up until recently there's been no real kind of coming together of those kind of entities to, to mm -hmm. look at this stuff but actually, I think, you know, WideScore are doing a great job around this in terms of moving from just looking at connectivity and kind of rubber stamping that into actually now starting to look at smart systems. Mm. And I think that will start to pay dividends in that it's raising a lot of awareness now for landlords that actually people do want to connect into those systems. Uh, but I think the other thing that we see is from a base build perspective, and again, this goes back to all those kind of different lenses on the building, you know, why would landlords care? Because from their use cases that they have and how they want to operate a building, you know, it's more hassle to allow someone else to be connecting into it. And, you know, why would they? Mm -hmm. Their focus is all about how do we get data out? How do we make sure that the building is efficient? And also, how do we make sure that we're recharging everything that tenants are consuming, whether that's, you know, water, electricity or, or whatever. So I think... Yeah, it's, it's coming. And I think we're certainly starting to see early specifications that talk about offering those services from landlords to tenants. But then also the implementation of how that happens. There are some kind of reasonably worrying gaps around things like securing tenants plugging into a building. Mm -hmm. uh, and even some ideas that will go out via the cloud, which from our perspective and, and looking at user experiences and kind of trying to keep latency low as far as we possibly can, 
that just it doesn't really sit like you know if you're a tenant in a building you want to be talking to the building within the building you don't want to be kind of going out to your cloud to go to their cloud to then come back into the building that you're already in like it just doesn't make any sense right so yeah i think it's coming but we just need to wait for the glacial pace right all the technology is here we can do it all tomorrow it's just it needs the the people with the checkbooks to start signing the checks and genuinely i think you know if there are people like that listening there are now people out in the market who are looking for this stuff and actually it shouldn't be a huge premium on service charge in my opinion because it really doesn't require that much investment but actually i think there probably is a premium there to to tenants who do want to really enable their spaces for experience and and being able to exchange data with landlords in real time yeah i think i think this is a missing piece of the covid conversation right now so people are talking about you know i want space analytics i want occupancy analytics but what they're not talking about and this kind of ties back to you know the course that we're sort of collaborating on right now and your colleagues are taking part in but like we're not talking about okay what are the use cases and acknowledging that those use cases cross the tenant boundary they cross the tenant and the building system boundary a lot and they cross the system boundary as well. So yep. lighting, HVAC, you know, access control, whatever. They're crossing these boundaries that historically we haven't really figured out a good way to cross. I, I feel like that whole conversation is missing. I feel like there's like Drawer and Anthony, like you're talking about how they're saying the office needs to evolve and all the landlords are saying, let's evolve. Like we're gonna, <laughs> you know, we're gonna motivate our tenants back into the building. But what, yep. what we're not saying is like behind the scenes, we have, you know, 20 years of technology progress to make up for really quickly to make that happen. Oh, 100%. Uh, I think that's missing. Anyway, we're not going to solve it here today. It's just something I'm seeing on a lot of my projects right now. So oh, I agree. Anyway, let's talk about maybe something that could solve that problem, which is the, <laughs> the master systems integrator. So you guys at Vanti cool. are a master systems integrator. I think this is a very perhaps misunderstood term in our marketplace. It's used worldwide. It's used in the U.S., I want to talk about like, what is the actual definition of a master systems integrator to, to you guys? Okay. So a couple of bits on this, and I, I have sat on stages at, at things like Integrated Systems Europe and the Smart Building Conference. I think it's, it's really important to get out. This is a self-proclaimed master systems integrator, right? So there's no, we haven't been accredited. There's no course that we've been on. The proof is in the pudding, right? So we can take you to a bunch of sites. We can show you the integration work. We can you know, introduce you to our software developers and, and the rest of the team that bring all this together. Uh, and I think it's really important we acknowledge that. But I also think the master part gets misunderstood as well in terms of, in fact, the best example I have of this is a big four controls company that shall remain nameless that we ended up in a, a bit of a competitive situation with. And the conversation turned to them becoming the master systems integrator. Mm. And the conversation then also went along the lines of, then we need to work out who the slaves are. Now, that isn't the way that we look at master in master systems integration at all. Uh, so for us, it is very much around kind of master craftspeople in terms of mm. people okay. who have got really good at their trade and really good at their craft and actually it's an acknowledgement that they have a breadth and depth of experience that is applicable to a certain situation. Got it. So um, good to clear up that misconception right away. Well with the amount we're trying to kind of work out master from things like you know code repositories and all that kind of stuff because of all of recent events yeah I think important that we we do get away from that as quickly as we possibly can and also very open to any other labels that we could use to to label ourselves but I did find uh, a definition because uh, I saw this came up on LinkedIn and um, Navigant put this out two years ago and I, I think it is still fully applicable. So they define it as a service provider that demonstrates domain experience in IT systems and networking, building automation and controls, application software analytics and support services. And then they go on to say an MSI can create and program cross system integration with complete interoperability. And that is what we do. So we are frequently described in our projects as the glue that binds everything mm -hmm. together. The recent large fit out that we did for a client in London, we had some absolutely 
amazing feedback from them to the extent that they were just like, we don't think we could have done this project without you. You literally went around and worked with every single one of our subcontractors to help them understand what you needed to get from the technology. And then you pulled it out of the bag and made it all work together. And so I think that for me all stands, it, it makes an awful lot of sense, but I think it's not just the technical element of MSI that's important, it is also the people element. Hmm. And I think we spend a good amount of our time, certainly early on in projects, really trying to work out where people are at on the, the technical understanding side of things, hmm. and then really supporting them if we need to, in terms of you know, whether it's getting devices onto the network, helping them understand subnet masks, helping them understand what a router is, understanding why they should change their default passwords, you know, all of those kind of things. And then if they've got all of that stuff in the bag, it's then potentially into, you know, why we need naming schemas within those systems, because actually it allows us to report the data better. And I think a lot of our building user experience work, we also use with other subcontractors to really um, bring the experience to life. So, you know, Sometimes if you're a system provider like access control, you might not be thinking you are this integral part of the overall building experience and what that journey is from sidewalk up to, up to your desk. Mm -hmm. But actually, you are the first touch point that most people will experience in a commercial building. Right, you're the first impression. To, yeah, exactly. And if that doesn't work properly or it's unreliable or whatever, then actually you're almost on a bit of a downer before you've even reached the lift. So I think there's a lot around being really integral with people. There's a lot around difficult conversations, for sure. There's also a huge amount around learning. And I think that's, it's one of the things that we always look for in our hires is anyone who turns up to Vanity and says they've got some kind of home lab, they're basically through the door straight away because we know that they're playing with technology in, in their own time and, and they do have that kind of learning attitude we tend to shy away from heavily kind of certified people. Mm. So yeah, we're, we're looking for people with kind of grit and determination that, you know, if they get a big hairy problem, they're going to go at it and keep going at it until they either resolve it or they can come up with some way of, of working around it. And because of the breadth of technology that we experience, that's also super important. Like we often talk about people needing to learn in minutes and hours, not days and weeks. Because it can be that we're in the middle of a job and, and suddenly the client will announce that they've bought some IoT solution that suddenly we need to work our magic to bring into the overall journey mm -hmm. or experience. Yeah. And, and then it's about, you know, into data sheets, contacting vendors, trying to understand how we can integrate with them and that kind of stuff. And you can't do that if you're not willing to almost roll with kind of what's going on a little bit. And I think that's why there are large systems integrators out there but they tend to be quite specialized and i think that's the the kind of tipping point really is it's that agility and ability to to move with things and bring in what's new not rely on heavy process strict ways of working and only doing stuff in a way that we've done it before because that that just well if you know construction if you're in a construction program the deadline never moves so it's about how do we make it work within the time we have left. Got it. There's so much I want to ask you about here. Where, where should we take this? I, I think what, what I want to do is actually just respond like with a little bit of a rant first. So you mentioned grit and determination and sort of like being the glue. And I feel like that is so sorely needed on a construction project or any sort of technology project. But I also feel like it's accommodating all of those siloed subcontractors, as you mentioned them, to just keep on doing what they've been doing because you know the MSI is going to figure it out. And there's part of me that's just like, that's not how it's supposed to be. And how would you respond to that rant, I guess, to begin with? Yeah, I think uh, agree to an extent. I think- This is more of like a philosophical question. I have more practical ones that are, that are coming up next, but- No, that's, that's just cool. Philosophize think, with me. So it's not those, um, because those people are also integrators, right? And I think they also tend to be specialized. So the example I always use around this is lighting. Okay, so as an MSI, we are not going to design you amazing looking lighting scenes. We are mm. not going to get into, you know, what color temperatures should go in, in which spaces and all this kind of thing, because 
I think we have to acknowledge that whilst it would be wonderful to know everything and be able to do absolutely everything, I think the thing that we acknowledge is kind of what's the boundary. And the boundary for us is around that integration, the data and control. It isn't about replacing the specialism. Hmm. And, and that specialism is also critical, right? Because there's you know, access control cards, there's a hundred different varieties and you know, getting the compatibility right and all that kind of stuff. And we can research that and doing that within a project, like, yeah, sure. But does that make us an access control specialist? Like, absolutely not. Totally. And so I think it's about appreciating, as, as well as all those different lenses that we talk about kind of on, on that building, it's also moving to a position of actually collaborating between all of these different people. And I think we're going to see lots more uh, kind of cooperation, if that makes sense. Like, you know, there are some jobs where we may compete against people that actually on another job will be working alongside or, or delivering something. And, and I think that's where, again, from a, a philosophical perspective, we don't believe that one vendor should do it all. And I think we see single vendors try to do absolutely everything and claim they do everything. But also, I think from my own experience, you know, even back in Oracle days, Oracle went on a mad spending spree to buy all these different companies like, you know, PeopleSoft and all that kind of stuff. And it took them years to properly integrate that into the rest of their solution so that it actually became Oracle HR. And I'm, I'm still not sure they've even achieved it, to be honest. But um, I think that's where in buildings and because of construction and the way that that works and the size and scale of things, you know, yeah, you could get to a stage and we've talked about it. You know, we've talked about the potential that in years to come, you will get something called like a main technology contractor. Uh, and actually it would be someone going, right, technology, absolute pain, just take the whole lot away from me. But kind of having looked at that, we were then like, well, you know, it's almost like how far down the rabbit hole do you go? Mm. Because, you know, once you start getting into color temperatures and whether it's, you know, Des5 version two or MyFair or, you know, whether you want to have people visible at 10 feet or 100 feet on CCTV, that is a specialism. Those skills are required. Mm -hmm. It's just those people don't need to bring network switches and servers and you know how do we kind of address those those boundaries which will be gray which will be blurry and you know even between projects it might be well we integrate all the way down because of a particular use case in one project but actually it's pretty light touch in another hmm. and so i think there is a um, there's always a drive towards kind of simplicity and you know one back to pat, one throat to choke, like however you want to describe it. Uh, and there is also that kind of real desire within construction that everything is delineated into like these boxed contracts that, right. you know, you can point at someone and be like, it's their fault. Uh, and that's where it does get difficult. And even, you know, our lawyers have sat us down and gone, you guys should really have kind of tri-party agreements here. Like, you know, you do so much work for a client but actually you're working through a main contractor, if they have a falling out, like you're in quite serious trouble because mm. legally you're obliged to the main contractor, not to the end user. But the problem is because we tend to then stay with the end user to look after things and the main contractor is going to, you know, disappear into the sunset onto, onto the next project. Yeah. It's tough at times. And also, you know, some construction sites are not nice places. Um, <laughs> And it can be uh, really difficult there. work environments. Uh, yeah. And especially where, you know, you are coming in as this kind of master role and kind of going, well, actually, you know, can we do this a bit differently or could we do this in this way? It can put people's noses out of joint. And I think people are starting to get a better handle on it. And honestly, conversations I've been having more recently with people in uh, the M&E space and also in the main contractor space, I think are growing in confidence to kind of go, actually, we don't really know about this stuff. And then it just becomes so much easier to just have a really straightforward conversation that says, well, that's cool because I also don't know anything about, you know, putting piles in the ground or building a steel structure or <laughs> cladding it or anything else. Like right. we're all here to do our part. And in the same way that 
I might need to ask you how I can run cable through the building or whatever. It would be great if you could come to me and go, actually, I don't know how to do this. Can you explain it to me? And then we can just sit down and have a really straightforward, plain talking conversation. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so I think what I'm hearing is that like the MSI, it's not a tell me what to do. Tell me what my scope of work is. Tell me where to go, what to be. It's more of a, a leader. Like you're pulling people together, pulling people along. It's a leadership role. You're in a consultation, basically. You're, you're a consultant yeah. in a way. And so Ooh, is that how you describe it? It's like a consultancy. And are you a contractor or are you just a con? Like talk to me about like business models okay. here. Yeah. So people get really upset when we call ourselves consultants, okay. um, which uh, I think, you know, it, it's fair. I think the other thing is we've been really open to working with consultants and, and we do. And in fact, actually, even today, um, huge global consultancy has approached us for a 1.8 million square foot building that is putting out a master systems integrator spec. And they've approached us because they've gone, actually, we can fulfill all of the project management stuff, all of the really detailed stuff they want doing around BIM, all of the lead well and BRIAM certification stuff, we've got specialists on staff to do that. What we don't have is the ability to technically architect it and to do all that system validation and make stuff work together. And that is like the perfect engagement for us hmm, because okay. it allows us to bring our technical skill, which is what we're so short of in the industry, but means we're not trying to be you know, consultants in how buildings go together and all the standards and how they work and everything else. And I mean, we've had some pretty direct exchanges with consultants who have come to us and said, you know, if we ever find out you're doing consultancy, you'll never appear on our tender lists again for being an integrator on our projects. Wow. And, you know, we're also not the people to be sat around writing, you know, I mean, some specs that come out are like, you know, reams of paper of just like, pages and pages of these are the things that are going to happen and it's not that we're not interested in that detail it's important it's just it's not where we focused our our kind of business so we love performance specifications when they're written as performance specs i think we genuinely really struggle when we get a very technically detailed spec through because the reaction is to then go Oh, okay, but you know, what about if we did this? And so it can become quite confrontational. Hmm. Whereas we've always said kind of doing all of the building user experience design, the, the user story mapping, the user journeys, all that kind of stuff. Like there are probably, there are digital agencies out there that are infinitely better than us at that. We could work with consultants and help them understand why we take that approach mostly because it really engages stakeholders, particularly developers, tenants, whoever else. If they can really graphically see what they're going to get at the end, they mm -hmm. really engage in it. Like, and they're like, oh, well, you know, could it do this or could we make this happen? And then, I mean, just like you're going through on the course, it's all about building that set of requirements and then fitting the technology to it. Not that we need to start with, you know, pages about it shall be mqtt and it shall be json and all this kind of stuff because why if that doesn't fit the use cases or it doesn't fit how the space is going to be used like why are we being that prescriptive about it so yeah we we tread really carefully around consultancy and i think the other thing is we're seeing this kind of emergence of master systems architect and master systems designer i mean in my opinion they're just terms that aren't required. Like consultants need to skill up on this stuff and then they just need to keep doing what they're great at. I think there are some more tools they can put in their toolkit. I think we're open to helping people do that because as far as we're concerned, the more people that can develop experiences and describe them to clients, well, actually they'll engage in them. And we've been on projects where you turn around to the client, you're like, so um, have you read the specification? And they're like, no, why would I read a 200 page technical document? And, and then you're like, well, so do you know what you're getting? And they were like, oh no, but you know, we, we just trust the consultants are going to give us what we need. And then you can get to the end of some projects and clients will stand there and be like, what on earth is this? This isn't what we talked about or what we asked for. And then you're in this really awkward position of, but it's what they told us to build. And so I, I think, again, this comes back to that kind of 
cooperation, the collaboration, like the, the lines are blurry. And I think particularly around where we pick up and consultants would stop. I mean, typically consultants are not interested being in a construction site, making tech work together. Like mm -hmm. I think they would, all of them would sit there and go, you know, not for us. Yeah. But I think the more overlap there is, the more powerful the end result can be because I mean, there's, there's so much context in design meetings and decisions that get taken and understanding that you just can't transfer even in a 200 page document like you'll never get that kind of yeah uh, stuff across to people so yeah it's it's blurry but we are 100 percent not being traditional consultants that is you're, you're a consultative contractor and you come in after Ooh, like the design firm well, yep. you come in, you, you would love to overlap with the design firm before they're done producing this spec. Maybe you have some influence on it, but you're not trying to get into that role is what I'm, what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great description and probably one I might start using. Um, can so steal but uh, yeah, I think we don't want to, we certainly don't want to eat their lunch, but it is about providing that technical specialism and also because this market is moving so quickly and we are really doing things that are different on the ground, we want to feed that back into that cycle as quickly as possible because, well, if we take it to a super macro level, the world is literally on fire and there are not enough people trying to make buildings more efficient right now. So either we all start working together or basically we're screwed. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I tried to go on a run this morning and uh, my neighborhood's full of smoke. So that's awesome. Um, no way. Oh yeah. So I think what I'm also hearing is that you guys are kind of side by side with the commissioning agent as well. So ideally most projects would have some sort of commissioning agent that is responsible for controls and mechanical and that type of nerdiness, like making those systems work. And you guys are basically saying we'll handle the the OTIT, like making the technology work, uh, is, is that a good way to understand it? Yeah, that's fair to say. And I think the, um, the checking part is quite difficult at the moment. And I, again, I hadn't appreciated in kind of BMS as we'd refer to it here or BS with you guys in that world that there was even that role. And I understand that on quite a lot of projects, it's common for the people who are actually installing it to kind of then go right hands off and it literally gets passed to commissioning people that come in and do it. Yeah. And I don't understand all the reasons for that, but it sounds like it wasn't in a good place and that makes it in a better place. So yeah, I yeah. guess, I mean, in terms of working alongside those people, like, yeah, but from our perspective, as soon as we can get a kind of integration report out of another system, that's really when we pick up. So mm. okay. as long as everything's been commissioned correctly and it's all labeled right, we're not looking well, it goes back to that specialism thing, you know, in terms of thermal loads in rooms and time that we should allow for kind of ramp up and cool down and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not our world. And we need those specialists to understand that because if they're not there, we can't pick it up. We can't do that work. Got it. Um, it's more collaboration and it, mm -hmm. it is working alongside them and, and just doing the right things. So, okay, so this next question might be a little bit of a transition into our next topic. Um, so you're talking about holistic thinking around the user experience and all the systems talking to each other. But I feel like what's still missing, and this is where I think a lot of people in this audience know that this hole is there, which is like this holistic data model that now that we've connected all these systems together, so you mentioned an integration, like you need some sort of integration report. Well. What I think is missing there is that, you know, this VAV box over here is in this room and that's served by this lighting panel and, you know, it's this tenant and all of those things are all connected. Yes, all the data is flowing and whatever, but where does the holistic data model sit that connects all of these databases and, and all of this communication together in your mind? In my mind, in my mind, that's the $64 million question, I think. Um, okay. So this is where there's a lot of complexity, right? And I think this is also a really natural thing with how buildings go together and also how they're used. So the, I mean, the very a natural best, problem right Yeah, now. I think so. Yeah. And I, I think it's also, 
I mean, honestly, I think it's unrealistic to think that we will solve a complete common data model from, you know, spade going in the ground, systems going into a building, and then, you know, moving into operation. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the example as to why. So let's say we're on some wonderful project, it's been fully designed in BIM, everyone's working in 3D, fully federated model, live collaboration around it, all good. Every space in that model will have an architectural name. And that architectural name will normally be something that's about the sequence of the spaces. So it'll be room one, room two, room three. And they, they normally use better referencing than that. But mm -hmm. it's that kind of order. So, you know, however that works and normally references floors and that kind of thing. If we then look forward, I mean, and they can go through lots of iterations, right? We've been on projects where you can have four different names for the same physical space. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you have a tenant move in, the tenant wants to call their meeting rooms after Greek gods or whatever. And suddenly, you know, what was our 1.14 down here is now called Zeus. You know, there's no connection between those, but there's also zero way that the architect would have gone, it's going to be Greek gods this time. It's going to be time. Greek gods this time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I think what we need to move towards, and this is part of the problems that we're trying to solve, is we need to allow for those references to exist in those multiple ways and make the connections between them. Now, mm -hmm. databases have been doing this for a long time with lookups and that kind of thing. But I think it's the ability to make that clear and the ability to expose things to people. So, and this is thinking quite far forward now, but wouldn't it be amazing if as a tenant moved in, they got some kind of questionnaire going, okay, well, what are you gonna call your rooms? And actually, that then all got fed back through. So if there was someone from FM, they could go, oh, you mean R114, but mm -hmm. you call it Zeus. <laughs> and so I think we need to get into this space of acknowledging the complexity and almost kind of embracing it and really getting our arms around it because it doesn't feel like we can get rid of it. And I think yeah. this whole kind of focus on there has to be one thing that represents the building, you know, could we get BIM to a stage where operationally it also has those names in? Well, yeah, probably. But actually, BIM as a technology also isn't there yet. We still, you know, when we work on projects at the moment, it's very common that we submit our changes in BIM to someone who then goes away and works for a week and comes back with a federated model and a clash report. So we are not at the stage yet where this model is existing right from the beginning of the project. And then it gets more and more difficult, which means it gets more and more expensive, which means less and less people want to do it as we move through the project. And so you get that kind of natural disconnect that happens. But it's about how can we use either ontologies in terms of a you know, brick haystack or whatever else to properly describe this stuff, but also then how can we augment them? Because it might be that the developer or the operating company of the building really want to use haystack and, and brick you might have then a tenant who moves in with their own facilities management who have never heard of haystack and brick right, and they right. want to go and call everything by something different and so it has to be about this acknowledgement that different people need different stuff mm -hmm. and then how do we all move forward on that to kind of go right and this is how it all looks so I'd love to have a perfect answer for you. I don't. It's also complicated by the fact that we have a bunch of stuff that lives on site and now we're also digital twinning. And so you then have two copies of exactly the same problem, one virtual and one physical. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I mean, architects get there first, right? So I think it makes sense to use that as the kind of base naming schema, but we have to acknowledge that those schemas change and also we could get to a point where buildings get bought and sold, right? There are people that trade these like cars as assets, like they'll buy one, they'll sell one. And actually, if someone else moves in and they, I don't know, they use Roman numerals rather than numbers to name their floors, the building should be able to respond to that. It shouldn't be locked into, you know, mm -hmm. what an architect decided at day dot 50 or 60 or 100 years later or whatever it might be. Well, let's use that as an example. So say building gets bought, this conference room over here was named Zeus. 
now I'm buying it and I want to name it after, you know, major league baseball teams or for in your case, uh, soccer teams in the UK. So what's the state of the art today? So like on a state of the art project, if that transaction happens, what I would want to happen, I think, is that automatically when I change it to the St. Louis Cardinals or Arsenal, my favorite team, that then repopulates all of the systems in the building and everyone now knows the truth, right? So like, what's the state of the art and how does that actually work today? <laughs> and, and this is not just about architectural names of rooms, right? This is about every aspect no, of I, how I, all I, these systems fit together. It's I get it. Example, and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll try not to focus too much on the, uh, on the naming. So genuinely, as far as I'm concerned, right now in every project that we've ever been in, the state of the art is, if you're lucky, a CAD-drawn floor plan, and someone will kind of submit that to the landlord as, here's what's mm -hmm. happened. It is not computerized, and it is, as far as I'm aware, does not often bridge that kind of landlord-tenant boundary. And there may be a good reason to say, well, does it need to? Because actually, from a landlord perspective, you're going, tenant, that's your space. Hmm. Yeah, but I got to go, I got to go to the lighting control system, change the name in there. I got to go to the BAS, change the name in there. I got to go to the, like you said, analytics overlay in the cloud. I got to change the name in there. I got to go to my digital twin company and I got to change the name in there. I got to go to the access control or the elevator or what, what I got to go to all yep, these yep. systems and I got to now change the name to Arsenal from yep. Zeus. Yeah. I, I that's, think, what, I mean, that's what I'm talking about with the data model, right? So in my mind, we have to have some sort of like centralized system that's keeping track of the fact that it was called Zeus and now it's called Arsenal. And what you're saying is like, we need somebody to translate like a decoder ring that translates all of these data models into one common, I got this for everybody type of model. Yeah, I think with the additional added complexity, so... I mean, let's take your example of a tenant floor, right? We could go five, 10 years with the same tenant and it's Zeus. The next tenant could come in and not only want to change Zeus to your major league baseball team, Cardinals, but also then take the partition out between Zeus yeah. and I'm out, I'm out of Greek gods. So you're then changing the space configuration. And I think that's where we see the stage that we should get to is kind of buildings of software. And I think... Well, in my opinion, and off the top of my head right now, late in the evening in the UK, the best shot at that is BIM, because it is designed to model these physical spaces and hold this information within the asset. And the ability within BIM to also essentially check out a space. So you can literally go, right, I'm going to take this whole floor out. I'm going to do my fit out and put all the services in it and then I'm gonna slot it back into your model. That already exists in that technology, right? It's just, we don't do it at the moment. And we also don't host BIM models as kind of living things. And so you'll quite often find that on the handover of a project from a main contractor, although it may have all been specified as, you know, must be BIM and all that kind of stuff, it's very rarely then used actively in operation. And I think that's getting better. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, it's also often handed over as here's your BIM file. It's not, oh, it's on this server and you now need to move it to yours so you can continue the hosting of it. And I think we're also seeing this in terms of um, even the kind of devices that are going into buildings. One of the roles that's being kind of pushed onto us is maintaining this inventory of all of the equipment that's going into the building. And that's down to you know, MAC addresses, serial numbers, what the devices are, who makes right. them, all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But it's also a completely separate data set to the model and, and everything else that goes on. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a real kind of slow, iterative slog through it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, the whole idea of building information modeling is that that's what we do. We model the information and we make it about the space. And if we could ever get to a point of being able to update live information into a BIM model so that, you know, owners, facilities, managers could move around it and actually see those values in real time. There's a load of conceptual stuff out there. I'm sure there's some people that have done it, but is it widely adopted and do people know it even exists? I would say not at the moment. 
I think there's a few digital twin companies out there that would like to say that they have this solved. And I think it's definitely one of the value propositions of the digital twin to For sure, yeah. sort of, I call it static data, keep all the static data just extremely well up to date and organized and contextually integrated with all the other data in the building. 100%. Fascinating. All right, let's move on to our final topic here. So I want to talk about smart core. So you mentioned okay. you, you like to recruit people for Vanti that uh, like to solve big, hairy problems. And I think that this is one of those big, hairy problems. So what is smart core? Let's just start there. Can you just describe it to us? Sure. So smart core is a distributed building operating system. And what we mean by that is it works a lot like kind of Mac OS or windows in the, it provides a layer on which you can then run other applications to interact with the rest of the building. And honestly, I think it has not only been through multiple iterations since it was a kind of twinkle in our eye about four years ago, but also it's really changed in scope as well. So we originally started looking at being able to go all the way from kind of that field or area controller level through supervisory and then also out to kind of analytics and cloud. But I think one of the things that we've really looked at a lot, certainly in the last probably 12, 18 months since we did the full rewrite, I can maybe touch on that in a minute, was that it just didn't make any sense for us to be trying to pursue things that actually lots of SaaS companies are now pursuing in terms of running portfolios at that kind of Mm -hmm. higher level outside of the building yeah and that actually the space that we were really operating in was that experiential within the four walls mm -hmm. so we've really kind of condensed that right down now and also we're well we're in some talks with and are interested in further conversations with anyone who is at that SaaS layer because at the moment it seems every single one of them is solving the same set of problems, which is trying to develop drivers for all the yeah. new systems. That Connecting with systems building. that are at the edge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so our kind of goal is to get to a set of tools and technologies and patterns that we will ultimately release open source to the world under the Creative Commons license that allow people to pick those up and integrate technology through construction and fit out programs to then deliver something that ultimately allows someone with a SaaS program to, to just come and plug, plug themselves in. in via an API. Now, in terms of that. And would that solve the problem we were just talking about for that SaaS company? So I changed my conference room name and they're still plugged into the API. And now the API just changes when you make that change locally yeah. in the OS. Yeah, kind of exactly. like with an iPhone. Like if I change my contacts in one app and then I want to share my notes in my notes app with that same contact that I just added, that's already, that contextual awareness is there across, across the platform. Yeah, so naming is something that we definitely consider as something that we should be trying to solve in a very consistent way. And at the moment, a lot of the focus is on translating out to the ontologies just mm -hmm. because of, some of the technologies that we've chosen don't lend themselves natively to that, but that's also a kind of very conscious choice that we've made mm -hmm. because we think the ontologies are still in quite early days. They're oh, still yeah. kind of developing themselves. And ultimately we want to come alongside and be bringing them in a bit later on. So you said one of the things on LinkedIn that I pulled was you said RPC is exactly what we found lacking and the motivation behind the project. So can you explain what RPC is and why it's lacking? So, uh, yeah, this is probably getting into a bit kind of Tom and Matt territory, but I'll, I'll do my best. They okay. will probably crucify me after this. <laughs> so RPC is the ability to say to something, please, can you go away and do this? And then that thing to go away and do its thing and then come back and go, cool, I've done it. And sometimes it will say, I've done it and here's the result. Mm, okay. So in terms of that, it means it's very reliable. So from a controls perspective and also from a user experience perspective, which as we've talked a lot about, we're really keen on. What we want to make sure of is if someone pushes a button and they're expecting something to happen, not only can we give them some feedback that that thing might be taking some time, but then when we get a response, we can go, cool, it's done. Mm, okay. The problem that we have when we start using protocols that are more designed for like telemetry or 
publish and subscribe approaches is it can be overly burdensome in terms of the number of cycles that you need to go through in terms of, I want this thing to happen, but then you don't get anything back to say that it has happened. So then you have to go back again and go, has it happened yet? No, it still hasn't happened. Has it happened yet? And Mm. throughout that whole time, it's a bit like the difference in IT between kind of TCP and UDP. TCP is kind of like, hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Whereas UDP is just me kind of shouting at you and hoping that you're receiving it. There's just, there's nothing that comes back the other way. So whilst it's not the absolute kind of foundation of what we're doing what we didn't want to create was something that was just based around publish and subscribe because it didn't feel like that lent itself best to all of the possible use cases and also bear in mind what we're trying to achieve with this ultimately is something that can provide really consistent experiences within a building using what are often inconsistent technologies. And it doesn't matter whether you speak to people that run co-working spaces or people who manage large portfolios. There is yet to be anyone that I've found that I've spoken to in that space that can confidently go, yeah, we use all of the same technology in all of our buildings. (laughs) It, It just doesn't happen because of the fragmentation. And when you've got people like that kind of big four accountancy that I mentioned earlier who have their own kind of workplace app, Well, that is a really consistent experience and they want their people to be able to fly to another office in Amsterdam or Madrid or wherever. And when they land, go, cool, I can use my workplace app to interact with this building exactly the same way as I do in London. And so that's the overall kind of purpose of this. And also then from a, a kind of building owner perspective, if you're in that world of kind of trading buildings as assets, you also want the confidence that you can kind of peel off anything that is operational and stick something on that could be something different. And that's where I think with the SaaS providers of the world, it really is going to take a bit of a kind of leap of faith there because what we're essentially asking them is, come on this journey with us. We think we've got a great idea as to how this can work. You can all benefit, but actually you're all going to benefit from this thing being here. And so there are going to be a lot of people who are just like, this is totally bonkers, not in a million years, we're just going to do this ourselves. Mm -hmm. But this is where it's important that we start acknowledging that it's not just about the stuff that's sitting out in the cloud. It is also about the experience of the people who turn up and actually have to interact with this stuff on a day-to-day basis. It is about the people who have to go around that building and maintain it and clean it and look after it. And they also need an experience of their own. And the thing that I liken it to is, you know, there is no one who operates or runs a building when they're showing someone around their new space, you know, they're they're getting really excited, you know, look at a great lobby area, all that kind of stuff. And they're moving through and they get up to a floor and they're like, oh, hang on a sec. I'll just pop a riser. Look at my copper piping. Like, (laughs) that's some pretty cool copper piping, right? Like, no one does that because Mm -hmm. we take piping for granted and it's standardized. And so this plays into that kind of, and I think you've been using the language a lot of kind of overlay technologies. Uh And that's really what this is. It's a lightweight framework, but it's also using some of the kind of thinking that Google and Apple have done a lot in the residential space. So how do we define things as traits? So how do we define that a device has brightness? If it's a light, how do we define it as having temperature, if it's, you know, a thermostat or it's a panel unit or whatever. And then what that also gives you, and this is really important from the skills perspective, is rather than us being down at these kind of obscure point names, then blow this open to a whole world of developers who can go, ah, this relates to an actual thing that I can see in real life. Oh, and I can see it in a digital twin. Oh, and now we can talk about it as all the same thing oh, and actually I can write some code against it so I can improve my building on my own. And uh, I did get accused the other day of this being some massively audacious thing. And I think there was someone that actually referenced it in the comments as well as, you know, why are you bothering? I've had comments previously about this sounds like a lot of effort. What's the point kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think when you've got so many stakeholders and people that interact with something like a building who are all frustrated with how it works, 
why wouldn't we try and pursue this and make it better? Oh yeah. And the reason that we've chosen to take the open source approach is we acknowledged as a group of people quite a while ago that the number of buildings that we could physically touch and actually make a difference to in our lifetime was not going to be very many because project yeah. cycles are long. Our typical engagements are between three months on the short end, but going up to kind of a year most of the time. And so realistically, even if we had the biggest fire hose of money in the world, even if we could go out and hire all the people there ever were, we're still not going to be able to make enough of a change. Yeah. And that's where we just decided, well, if other people like what we do and they want to come along for the journey, then great. Hopefully we can make something of it. Hopefully in, well, I'm hoping even in like a year or two years time, let alone five or 10, mm -hmm. you know, there will be an ecosystem around this and there will be a bunch of people winning because they've actually implemented this in their buildings. But let's see. Let me see if I can answer the why bother question about this. So I saw several comments on LinkedIn about, you know, why would you try this? This is too big, too hairy, too messy. And, and let me sort of describe what I see as like why. So let's say you have a building right now, or maybe even a portfolio. Across that portfolio, you have things like the Comfy app, right? Where, you know, you're installing Comfy and the Comfy engineers, really smart people are coming in and integrating with the HVAC system so that the tenant can control their personal set point in their office, right? So that integration is happening. And then over here, the building operator really wants fault detection. And so they go out and they say, hey, I really would like to implement Copper Tree Analytics. And so Copper Tree Analytics comes in and they're really smart engineers. You know what they do? They go ahead and they integrate with the HVAC system. And this is just one use case, right? And just, there are two use cases two types of integration that are basically redundant in my opinion, right? So you're Agreed. saying, I'm going to talk to the HVAC system and then I'm going to create a data model for that HVAC system that is customized for my application, right? And I think what you're describing is that, okay, what if we just all decided and those comfy engineers and the copper tree engineers, what if they all decided that, hey, we're actually all just gonna integrate like this and then we're going to contribute to an open source project that makes that integration process better and better and better. And you know what? The next time someone sets up Comfy on the other side of the world, they can now use that integration process. And this sort of ties in the conversation with Andrew a few weeks ago where we don't have these projects and buildings that are like this. We have projects like Project Haystack and things like that where people are, are coming together. But we have, I think the terminology he used was people are building, like putting bricks together over here. And then people are basically reinventing the, how they're going to do that brick over there. And they yeah. haven't decided that, Hey, once we do that brick, we're just going to reuse that code over again, basically. And I, I think what people are missing when they say, why bother is that there's so much savings with the integration process, but also if we all decided we were going to do it together, we would also unlock new use cases, right? So Massively. What if Copper Tree and Comfy now could then say, okay, when Comfy is installed, Copper Tree is going to unlock these new FDD analytics and vice versa, right? And I think that's what we're missing is we're all spending so much time on integration and doing the same shit differently that yep. we're not able to get to those new use cases that then move the industry forward. So that's my rant of the day. Am I on the right no, track there? Uh, 100%. So I think, uh, and actually I, I meant to touch on this earlier because we were very, very close to becoming a, a tritium house. And actually the reason that we didn't go down the Niagara route was we couldn't shift their code into a standard development environment. And it was our developers' biggest bugbear with things like, whether it was Netlinks with AMX so I mentioned or Simple in Crestron. There just isn't that understanding of the development life cycles that are used in kind of more enterprise IT approaches. And this plays into, you know, even just interacting with Git to store your code and stuff like that. And so what we wanted as an integrator was the ability to do this quickly. And there was so much stuff that I sat through when you and Andrew were talking. And I was just like, I cannot believe that someone who sat on the other side of the world is also talking about Lego bricks for how we kind of put all this stuff mm -hmm. together. 
But that's exactly it. And it's the way that we view it is there is no point having all of these integrators expending all of this energy when actually there's, you know, an actual bonfire of the planet occurring. Yeah. And actually we just all need to kind of crack on and, and make stuff better. And I think the other thing that is really important that we decided quite early was whilst the code base for smart core will be under creative commons and the license that we've chosen is share alike so that means if you take it and you change it you have to release it under the same terms hmm. but what we didn't want to do was restrict people in a way that meant we couldn't have proprietary stuff come and interact with that whole ecosystem and actually i think it's probably something that's going to be actively encouraged and i think you know Tridium have done a phenomenal job in terms of their marketplace, but it's still at the stage where you're still paying for licenses. The example I always go to, I don't know why, I think it's an image I picked out in a presentation a long time ago, but if we had someone in the world, say a town hall in Guatemala that suddenly wanted to automate their heating and lighting and make it events based around a Google calendar, we want them to be able to go and pick up SmartCore use all the bricks that have been opened by other people and just get on with making that town hall the most optimal place it can be. And the idea is eventually we will have a community edition that is like that. And then if people want enterprise support, then that will be something that they could pay for. But we also think there's a really good chance that SmartCore will just get to a stage of being an integration framework that people will just pick up and use because as we found in our most recent project. And I absolutely loved this because one of our developers, Matt, came back absolutely beaming. And he was like, not only did we use SmartCore, but actually it was the best way of achieving the integration between those systems because it was so quick. We built a load of stuff already and it just meant we could actually get on with delivering real value to the client who was ultimately going to be you know, interacting with that experience. So. It's working, it's early days, it is a very audacious play, but I think, as you say, if we're actually all gonna kind of come around this, this challenge, there are ample opportunities for people to make loads of money. There's 2.6 billion buildings in the world or whatever it is. You know, there's enough to go at here, and ultimately there's a chronic skill shortage. So if you wanna to come to the party and play, let's, let's play. Love that. Yeah, I love that. All right. So I think my friend Corey is going to be mad at me if I don't shove some of these other questions at you that he had on LinkedIn. So thanks for your questions, Corey. We got to let Mike get to dinner at some point here, but let's throw these questions out. So I think the only one that you haven't answered yet is we have all these other open source projects going on. So we mentioned Haystack and Brick. So Corey works on Building Sync at NREL. Shout out to all the NRLians. Um, there's GBXML, CityGML, IFC, and then shout out to Alper with Sedona and Project sure. Sandstar. Yeah. So you, you mentioned kind of developing alongside all of these other open source efforts. And so how does that interaction work with those efforts? Yeah. So I think if you look at Linux as an ecosystem, like there's one Linux kernel, but there's Ubuntu, there's Fedora, there's CentOS, there's mm. Red Hat, you know, they all coexist. But also I think it was really interesting because we did have this um, a little while ago when someone was kind of like, you know, you, you're reinventing Voltron. I was really fortunate to talk to Andrew the other week and we talked a lot about the differences between what we were doing and where we actually ended up was, oh, it's been quite a sweet fit because actually Voltron's entirely focused on energy and grid and load shedding and all that kind of stuff. That isn't what smart core is designed to do. And so this is also where we get into, as well as that kind of commercial cooperation, Actually, there's quite a lot of just collaboration that's possible within open source. Just because it's another open source project doesn't mean it's going to, you know, subsume or consume or push out others. Could there be some overlaps? Sure. But actually, a lot of what we talked about was because SmartCore is so focused on the experience, it's so focused on the kind of in-building stuff that actually connection into stuff like Voltron, which doesn't really have much in the way of interfaces or things that really are, are client facing. And that actually smart code could be used as a way to get that data out to people or to perform control tasks. Different architectures, 
it might be for some settings it works best and there's no need for something like smart core i'm sure there will be projects where voltron in terms of its focus on power and everything else makes all the sense in the world and so smart core would go nowhere near it so i i think everything is so sufficiently new that everyone is still finding their feet and i think that's where I've really kind of bought into the, the honesty and integrity of, of you and Nexus insofar as you're very open about this is a, a learning journey for you. But I think we need more people to kind of acknowledge they're also on the learning journey. And I think, you know, Andrew's whole thing about the, the kind of fog of war and the, the big four marketing machine kind of pumping all this stuff out. I, I genuinely think, I mean, I've seen some collateral, again, from the, the big four player that I actually mentioned earlier, that says they have a million smart buildings worldwide. And I was just like, well, where are they? Because yeah. everyone keeps talking about the edge, which is a great building, but turning up to the smart building conference every year and still talking about the edge makes me think there are not a million smart buildings in the world yet. So I, I think the more that we can get to a stage of all engaging this kind of learning mentality and that we're all on the journey and actually, yeah, maybe there will be some overlap and maybe we will need a difficult conversation about you treading on my toes. But actually, as we've already said, there is so much to go at here, Mm -hmm. like so much that actually we just really need people to kind of get on board with stuff, get learning and, and get doing. Like we cannot keep building buildings like we're doing. It's just madness, totally. absolute madness. 100% agree. So how can people get involved in Smart Core Foundation? So we are early, early days. Mm-hmm. We are due to be pushing out an API. I'm going to say this month, um, and I'll get shot by Tom and Matt some more probably, and, and Ben and the, the rest of the team. Basically, if you want to get involved, www.smart-core.tech. Have a read of the page. There's a form down the bottom. It asks you who you are. If you want to contribute, hit that button, give us your details, and we'll be in touch. We would love to hear from anyone who wants to get on board. We have spent a lot of money getting this far. We've made a huge number of mistakes. We've gone from spaghetti wear configurations to centralized configurations to now fully distributed. We've rewritten the whole thing from Java into Go. It's been quite a journey, but we've got to the point now where we've really acknowledged that we need those other lenses on this now to go Mm -hmm. and contribute to making this something that is properly holistic because we don't want to be in the position of some of the ontologies, which are so heavily rooted in BAS, it makes them difficult to shift into access control, audio, visual, you know, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, we need those different lenses. Otherwise, we're not going to get it right on our own. And we know that. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm one of those people that's filled out the form and happy to be involved and help out however I can. I think Thanks it's so much. a perfect fit for Nexus as well as just, you know, this is why Nexus was created is to help out with things like this. So thanks so much, Mike. Uh, we'll have to let you, uh, it's what, eight o'clock, something like that in the UK. It's so let Mike get to, to dinner and uh, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. All right, friends, thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, please subscribe at nexus.substack.com. You can find show notes for this conversation there as well. As always, please reach out on LinkedIn with any thoughts on this episode. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day.